Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Everybody seems awake and, and lively. So uh, I'm not necessarily going to teach so much this morning. I'm going to give you a little short window of kind of testimony and also encouragement to you guys. Um, so just a quick introduction. My name is Jason. I am here with two other guys from Calvary Chapel in San Jose, California. And uh, we are looking to start a CBI in San Jose. So we're here doing some... Uh, you know, checking out the place, gleaning what we can about the school. And while we're here, we're going to share a little bit with you guys. Um, but why don't we start off with uh, prayer? I'll just, I'll just leave some prayer to open this morning. Heavenly Father, we're grateful, Lord, to, uh, to be here, Lord, just sitting under your word, Lord, to, uh, Lord, to, to seek you, Lord, to know you more, Lord, to uh, be conformed to your image. And Lord, I pray that you would do that as we're here, Lord, in this short time, Lord, even for the students throughout the semester, Lord, that that would be the ultimate goal, Lord, that you would conform each one to your image, Lord, that we would be more like Christ, Lord, that we would be your witnesses, Lord, your ambassadors to a lost and dying world, Lord. I pray you do that work in us and through us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, uh, I can tell you guys this to be kind of funny, but it's true. I really don't know how I got here, right? I really don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> and that's the truth, and I'll explain it to you why, but I also want to let that be an encouragement to you guys, that uh, I'm from Pennsylvania, actually. I'm serving in San Jose, but I'm from Pennsylvania, and how I got here, I can tell you the path. It's kind of a long, windy path, but, but how I actually got here, honestly, it's the Lord, I don't know. So uh, I have a, a beautiful wife that we've been married 14 years. We just celebrated our anniversary last week, uh, two weeks ago, actually, sorry. Um, but anyway, uh, she loves the Lord. She's a great uh, influence in my life. But anyway, I did not know the Lord at your age, most of you, I would say. And uh, I was heading in a completely different path. Praise the Lord, he saved me. Uh, you know, even after that, you know, I, I met my wife and we got married and we had a, a beautiful house. We started, I started serving the Lord, come to know the Lord, reading his word. And uh, long story short, you know, we were on a path. I was on a path. I had a business. I started a business, sold that. Like I said, we had a house. We were doing ministry pretty much all the time. Even though we weren't in full-time ministry, we were doing ministry. We had a home fellowship. We served in the, uh, in the youth group. Um, I'm, a, I'm still a deacon in a church in Pennsylvania. We just Anyway, we're doing so many things. We had a lot of young adults, things going on in our house. Uh, you name it. We were serving the Lord, you know, fully, but yet not in full-time ministry. So I would say now I'm in full-time ministry, but I really <laughs> don't exactly know how I got here and, and really what the Lord has. But at one point, after several years of really praying, what happened was, the Lord gave my wife and I both an unsettled feeling. You know, even though we were serving him wholeheartedly, yet he gave us both at the same time this unsettledness of like, Lord, there's, there's something else. Like, what do you have? So not right away, but we spent several years with other people just praying about, Lord, what do you have? So eventually that led to us selling our house, getting rid of mostly everything and serving the Lord full time with the idea, with the intent, the vision of to be a support to pastors and to churches. So sort of like a missionary but not going to a far off land, unless the Lord calls us that, but really to be a missionary to serve churches and pastors. So that's how we got here in a nutshell. The path here was a long, windy road, but um, I want that to be an encouragement to you guys when I say I don't know what I'm doing, because that's real. Our ministry is that we are constantly praying, Lord, what do you have? Because it doesn't look the same all the time. We're in San Jose right now. We're actually getting... Uh, in, a, in about a month, getting ready to head back to Pennsylvania and, and continue to pray about what the Lord has next. But that's currently uh, where we are serving. And even that has been like a, a windy journey. We went there to actually start doing some construction work to help with construction of the facility. And that was uh, almost two years ago. And now I'm serving as administrative pastor there. So starting off again, 20, 25 years ago, a completely different path, and how I got here today, it's, it's only by the Lord's grace. And, uh, you know, it's His calling, it's something I completely did not plan for, um, wouldn't, would never have seen it in a million years. So 
I want that to be encouragement to you guys. You know, I don't know what each one of you are here specifically for. If the Lord has given you a specific calling, that's great. But just be flexible. Be open to the Lord's leading because you never know what he's going to actually call you to do. You don't know what it's going to look like. Things change all the time. And, you know, I think it's great if you know at this age, I, 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 honestly, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, and I still don't know exactly what the Lord has, but just to serve him, to seek him. And I think that's the greatest thing we can do is just be in his word, even be in the school and, and just seeking him constantly. Lord, what do you have for me? Because it may look different. So um, with that, I just wanted to uh, turn your attention to Noah. It just came to my mind, and it's Genesis chapter 6. Like I said, I'm not really going to be teaching, but uh, just a couple things to, to look at this morning. You know, Noah really came to my mind in, uh, in the thing about talking to you guys. So just uh, real quick, what was Noah's calling? What did the Lord call Noah to do? Build the ark. Build the ark. That's a trick question to say, you guys, thank you for taking the bait. <laughs> now, it's true. He did. The Lord did call him to build it. But you know what it says in 2 Peter that, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was a preacher, right? And it says he was 500 years old when the Lord called him to, to build the ark. So what did he do for the first 500 years of his life? He, he was a preacher. He had kids, Right. I think that was really the Lord's first calling on his life because the Lord's heart, again, still in 2 Peter, would be that all would come to repentance. The Lord's heart is not to judge the people, to destroy them, but to bring them to repentance. So really the Lord called Noah to be a preacher of righteousness. But the Lord changed the Lord changed his calling, maybe not changed his calling, but gave him another calling, maybe is a better way to say it. He gave him another calling. So he did call him to build the ark. And then what about after the ark, after the flood, it says it was in the 600th year, but Noah lived in 900 years, right? So he still had more calling for his life. He had not just grandkids, great-grandkids. He probably had great-great-great-great-grandkids to raise, right? Being a preacher of righteousness, he had to pour into the lives of all these kids to, to his kids. So anyway, in, in Genesis chapter 6, a couple of things that stood out to me. Verse 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then if you go down to uh, verse 8, see God in verse 5, he saw, he's seeing. God is looking down at man. He's seeing the wickedness. But at the same time, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord saw Noah, which if you read on, it said he was... He was a just man, perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. See, Noah, even though we know he was called to build the ark, you know, the, the way he got there, how he got about to build the ark, I believe is because he was doing just as the Lord had called him to, to be a preacher of righteousness. And it says that he was a just man and he was perfect. It doesn't mean he was perfect in his conduct. He was a sinner, but yet his heart was perfect towards the Lord, wanting to seek the Lord and do his will. And at that time, the Lord looking down saw, this is a person I can use. This is a person who's not following the wickedness of the world. And yet he was perfect towards the Lord. His heart was perfect. Um, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. You don't have to turn if you want. I'll just read it. It says, yet for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. See, the Lord is looking for those whose heart is perfect toward him, just like Noah. He wants to use us, just like he used my wife and I. Many of you, he's going to use for things you may not even imagine. Can't even contemplate what he's going to do. And, and uh, man, how about Pastor uh, Garrett yesterday? I don't know about you guys. I'm about the same age as him, a little bit older, but... Uh, Boy, so much stuff he said I could, I could resonate with. I was just loving what he was, what he was preaching because it's real life stuff. It's real stuff that happens when you're in ministry. And so uh, anyway, the Lord's looking for those who he can show himself strong on, on, on our behalf. And uh, again, my encouragement to you guys, you may have an idea what you're going to do, but be, be open to what the Lord has and be seeking him. You know, you may be here studying. You may spend a year, two years 
What if the Lord calls you to be a housewife? Right? What if he calls you just to take a secular job? Does it mean you can't minister? He uses us in the everyday things in the world to minister. He was using my wife and I for years before he called us to, to full-time ministry. But be faithful in it. And again, it's not a waste of time here. If, if he calls you again to, to have a job, do whatever, I mean, whatever it may be. Even a housewife, raising kids, you know, the Lord called Hannah, really the, the ministry, she, she, she wasn't even the one really the focus is, is on Samuel, but she was that mother that raised the prophet because of her godly influence to dedicate him to the Lord. That could be you. That could be a calling the Lord has. So, and again, just, just be open to it. That's my encouragement to you today. Again, we're, we're praying, my wife and I, uh, our, our church, and family, just praying, you know, what do you have for us, Lord? And, uh, you know, whatever it may be, the time here, just remember, is not wasted. You know, you could go to a four-year college. I actually started out at your age going to a, a four-year college and dropped out. But, you know, think of how many people have de college degrees. You know, the statistics show that most people don't go into their field of work from what their degree was, you know, whether you say it's waste or not, yeah, you could waste four years of degree, but your time here is, is never wasted. Your time here is valuable. No matter what you do, you can still minister to the Lord in, in any way, and, it, and it's not wasted. So um, just let that be an encouragement to you guys. Don't be set. I mean, I think it's great. Again, don't misunderstand me. Know what the Lord's calling is for your life and, and pursue it, but, but don't be so set that you get discouraged if he changes your plans, right? Um, I'd also, uh, while I'm here, just want to give you a quick update on Calvary San Jose. Uh, Pastor Mike asked me to uh, share a little bit with you guys. So um, in his words, I will let you know, Calvary San Jose, we are the finest church in America. <laughs> and, and I say that, and he says that meaning we are the finest church, meaning we have the most fines of any church in America, and even the world probably. So uh, during the whole lockdown, um, by the leading of the Lord, the church stayed open since uh, last May 31st. The church opened up inside against all of the uh, county rules. And uh, as a side note, Santa Clara County, where we are, is the, is the strictest county in the country. Also probably the most wicked. But anyway... The total fines for staying open, besides all the harassment, is $3.8 million. So uh, we got to $2.7 million, and then the county continued to fine us without telling us. So it went to 3.8. They dropped the 3.8 back down to 2.7 because they did it illegally and fined us without telling us. So, but we still stand at $2.7 million in fines. But uh, we believe the Lord is going gonna, is gonna to remove all that. And uh, in the meantime, while this has been going on for the past year and a half, I can tell you guys there has been a, a mini revival happening in San Jose. It's, it's amazing. There's so many people coming to the Lord, and it's, it's one of the most unchurched areas in the country. And uh, when, when my wife and I got there in January 2020, there was about 300 people in the church there's over 2,000 people now. And people are getting saved every week, every week. Um, so it, it's been an awesome testimony. And when I, and when I tell you guys this whole story with Noah and myself, you know, how, how my wife and I got there to San Jose, it's the Lord. Because, you know, the Bible says, we, we just looked at Noah, that, that the Lord is looking for those. He's seeing. He's seeing what's happening, looking for those who are, are seeking him and willing to serve him. And, you know, there was a time, I don't believe maybe now, but during this past year in San Jose, when we were facing possible jail time, you know, personal fines, even Pastor Mike and one of the other assistant pastors are still have over $35,000 of personal fines against them as well for staying open. So anyway, there was a time that we were facing all that stuff, and yet I was willing, my wife were willing to, okay, Lord, whatever you have, if it means jail, if it means losing stuff. But see, the thing is, the Lord already prepared us. It's crazy how he works. We would have never seen it afar off. And I think uh, Pastor Garrett said it yesterday, you know, if the Lord showed you 
what he had for you, just these things, you, would, you might freak out. You might say no if he showed you ahead of time. But, you know, think about the position. We had already sold our house and gave up everything. What do we have to lose? You know, the Lord prepared us ahead of time, a couple years in advance for, for the time such as now. So um, it's just awesome to see what he, what he can do and what he will do if we're willing to uh, just be obedient and seek him and, and follow him, whatever he has. So uh, anyway, uh, that's about all I have. Again, the, the church is still, still has the $2.7 million fines. We're still in litigation, but uh, we believe the Lord's going to deliver. But um, make no mistake, there is a, there's definitely a revival happening, and the church needs help. So any of you guys uh, want to go on the front lines of the battle... When you leave here, uh, there's definitely plenty of many ministry opportunities there, as well as, again, we're starting a CBI, Lord willing, in San Jose. So um, that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Perry is going to come up next and share a little with you guys. All right? God bless you. How you guys doing? Good, good. My name is Perry Davalu, and I just wanted to quickly talk about the power of the gospel. And um, tomorrow is a very special day in my life because that's a day when I came to Christ. That was my 911 to the Lord um, back in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 1991. And uh, and I come from a uh, Islamic background, both of my, I'm Iranian, both of my parents, you know, uh, Iranian, and, uh, but I was born here, but when I was seven months old, my parents went back to Iran, and I was there for 10 years, so I grew up, uh, you know, just learning the culture and everything, or just being part of the culture, and, but then I ended up uh, coming back here uh, 10 years later, when I was 10 years old, I came here and, uh, and so I always consider myself to be a Muslim, and I never uh, allowed anybody to tell me otherwise. Jehovah Witnesses would come to my door, or Mormons. I would always chase them off, you know, and, and tell them, I'm a Muslim, and you're not going to change that. That's the way I am. That's the way I'm going to die. You're not going to change that. Obviously, the Lord had other plans. Um, and one of my best friends in high school, or I'm sorry, elementary all the way um, into high school was a Mormon who was a couple of houses down, and I, we became really, really good friends. And so him and his family were always trying to convert me to Mormonism, but I spent a lot of time at their house. And um, so I got to learn some things about Mormonism, and I really liked it because it was a way of, um, you know, you could do all these good things to get closer to God. So I like that. And so... Um, so that's what, you know, drew me more and more to learn. And I was going to the Mormon church for a while, even with them, just to, you know, but I enjoyed going there. Anyway, so, but I still said I'm a Muslim, and that's the way it is. Um, but um, just the power of the gospel, just um, the way I had never gone to church previous to coming to the Lord. I'd never gone, I've never read the Bible, never went to, never heard of Jesus, even though I lived in America. I heard it in different ways, but not the Christian way. And, and it took uh, a lot of things in my life to, for me to hit rock bottom. And that's when I looked up, and that's when um, these people started witnessing to me at work. And uh, within 72 hours from hearing the gospel to when I accepted Christ, I mean, it was just a lot of things that the Lord did in my heart and um, and I was uh, at that moment I was radically changed by Jesus Christ, and my life has never been the same since. Um, and um, and I just think of how powerful the gospel is because of just what I've seen since I've become a Christian, and the people that have gotten saved around me, my own family members have gotten saved. Um, and I just think that you know the Lord is not willing that 
it's just not slack, concerning his promise, uh, as some count slackness in 2 Peter 3, 9. Um, but, you know, he's long-suffering toward us, that he's not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I think that, you know, the Lord is always trying to get people to get saved. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, and again, I've seen so many things happen uh, over these years that, um, you know, since I've become a Christian, my mom has become a Christian, and my mom was really, really hard person, total Islamic person, you know, I'll never change either. She's come to the Lord, my sister's come to the Lord, my uncles have come to the Lord, my aunts come to the Lord, um, and uh, and so, you know, all these things, uh, the Lord has shown me that all we need to do is open our mouth and share the gospel and uh, leave the results up to God. God takes care of all of those things. Um, as, uh, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, um, he says, uh, I planted, uh, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You know, all we, you know, we need to do is just share the gospel um, and live the gospel as well, of course. But um, I think of, uh, you know, eventually down the road, uh, you know, um, a few years back, back in 2011, um, I had broken out. I, I, I was no longer friends with my Mormon friend that I grew up with. Because I got into drugs and all those uh, that whole thing, and um, drug scene, and then my my Mormon friend, uh, you know, uh, I didn't see him for after uh, after high school, and uh, he ended up moving to Oregon, and uh, so for 15 years I didn't hear, I didn't know where he was, what he was doing, and he calls me back one day just weeping, and I didn't even know he had my number, and I didn't know that he knew I was a Christian. And um, so he was weeping. His brother had committed suicide, and he wanted me to go over there um, and just help him out and uh, to just support him. And so I had gone out there, and long story short, I was able to lead him to Christ, you know. And, uh, and it just, all I did was just do what, you know, the Word of God says to do. I just went, and uh, the Lord did the work. It was just amazing how the Lord completely... Um, uh, did that whole thing. And then I also think of just the power of the gospel, how um, I remember a few years back, Pastor Chuck, he had a, um, there was an Iranian uh, pastor that had started a ministry from Costa Mesa and was sat, was sending satellite uh, or the satellite um, station in Iran. And people were getting saved and uh, and they were calling him up and saying, what do we do? You know, we, we, just, we just prayed the sinner's prayer. What do we do? And he was like, well, go, go to church. And then he realized, well, there's no church. Uh, and then he said, well, get baptized, you know. And so they call him up a couple days later, and they're like, well, we're in the, we got him in the bathtub. What do we do now, you know? And he's telling them, well, put him underwater, you know, and, and baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And... Um, and so just the power of the gospel, you know, going over. And then I remember a few years back, too, where my aunt, uh, living in Iran, you know, know nothing about the gospel. Um, she was listening on, on the satellite TV, hearing the gospel. And it was being broadcast from where I live in San Jose. And, um, and so she's watching it, watching it. And what Iran, go Iranian government does, they come and they take everyone's satellite because it's illegal to have satellite TV over there. So they take it all, and then they'll come back later on, sell it to the people again, and then they'll come again and take it all. But anyways, in that whole process, she was watching this pastor who was sending satellite images over there, you know. Um, and so she, so she decided to come and visit us uh, one year. And, um, and so we were, I was going to take her to my church, but she doesn't know how to speak. You know, she doesn't understand English. So I told my uncle, uh, let's take her to the Iranian church. Well, that church happened to be the same church she was listening to in Iran. And uh, so when she saw the pastor, she was, she was like, that's the man. And so after the service, you know, I took her down there and she was able to, you know, he prayed the sinner's prayer. She prayed the sinner's prayer with him and uh, she got saved. And then years later, she, you know, she's in Iran. She's telling others about Jesus. And my grandmother, who's a devout Muslim, um, at age 90, um, she uh, got sick. And so 
my aunt hired a lady who was a Christian over there, started witnessing to my grandmother, and my grandmother received the Lord, you know, and that was a miracle because in Iran, devout Muslim all her life, and then she received the Lord. And it just, it's just amazing just to share the gospel with people and leave the results up to God. And, um, you know, and, and just, it's just awesome. Uh, one of the verses that um, also I wanted to share was um, real quick is um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Um, this verse is just so powerful. Um, but it says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are per perishing, um, whose mind, minds the God of this age has blinded. And, you know, how Satan is the prince of the power of the air right now, and he's blinded people's eyes so that they cannot see that if they died right now, they would go to hell, just like we didn't see it before we got saved. And, and, and it's just like asking a paralyzed person to walk to you. They can't. They don't know. They can't perceive it. They can't understand it. But I like the, the fact that it says, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of, of, the, um, of, the, of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine on them. Just the fact that if those veils are lifted and the light of the gospel is shown on them, they are going to get saved. They are going to see that they are a sinner in front, in front of a holy, perfect God. And I just think that um, when we pray that prayer and, and quote this verse back to God and say, God, I'm just praying that their eyes would be opened, that your light of your gospel would shine on them, that they would come to you. And, and I've seen that happen in people's lives that I prayed that, and there has been an opening in their mind, and they have received the Lord. So um, we need to use God's word to, you know, go and, and, uh, and be able to use it as a power to um, be able to share the gospel with people. Um, you know, like when we witness to people, it's good sometimes to have the people actually read out of the Bible themselves rather than, uh, you know, you telling them. Uh, there's power behind it. But anyway, so... Um, that's about all I wanted to share with you guys, just that encourage you guys to just keep doing what you're doing. You guys are blessed to be where you're at right now. You know, when I was your age, I wish, you know, I had this opportunity, but this is so great that you guys are here. God bless each one of you guys, and uh, we love you guys. Thanks. Hello, good morning. good morning. So my name is Joe Novello, and I, I'm really sure that none of you know me. Uh, I am from California, but I spent most of my spiritual career on the East Coast or overseas. Um, I, start, I got saved in 84. By 1987, I was working with an organization called Mercy Ships. So people asked, you know, where was I a missionary? It's a little hard because over those years we went to 18 different countries. Uh, then I worked at uh, a couple different Calvary chapels in Florida. And then uh, I had met my wife in 1988 when I was a, a missionary with Mercy Ship. She's Brazilian. We were going up and down the Amazon. And uh, she was a translator. That's how I met her. She tells a story she really didn't like me when we first met. It's a whole other story. But we'd been married 28 years, and then uh, in 2008, God called us to be missionaries, full-time missionaries in Brazil, so I really spent, my wife and I, the last 13 years ministering in the Amazon jungle. We specialized in people that were off-grid. There's 36,000 communities only accessible by boat. Now, I was in a youth group, and some smart kid said, oh, you could parachute in. And I said, yeah, you still need a boat to get out. So, but that's the type of ministry we were involved in. And it has its roots uh, in 
what I did in 1988 with, with the ships. So being a ship's officer, I combined what I knew about ministry, what I knew about boats, and we created a ministry. And Pastor Jason gave a nice testimony of how he ended up here. And I'm actually in California because my mother had a stroke. And she's actually doing reasonably well, but that called us off the mission field. But my mother's house is 15 house links from Calvary Chapel, San Jose. So I'm able to go over there and volunteer. They kind of make jokes because I have a little walkie-talkie. My mom can't dial a phone, but she can call me on the walkie-talkie, and I can run to my mom's house in a minute and 42 seconds. So, so that's how I ended up here. And then it was supposed to be a six-month sabbatical, but when we found out that really we needed to stay, we needed to stay in California, um, I was offered some ministry opportunities, which is starting the Calvary Bible Institute in San Jose. They've had the vision for three years, trying to get it off the ground. So finally, it probably is. If you see, kind of just as a joke, we changed the logo down here. We'll, we'll put it back, but we're trying to get some of our own shots for a promotional video, so, so thank you. Um, so that gives you a little bit uh, about my background. Um, so I've been with, first attended Calvary Chapels in 1988, so maybe before some of you were born or all of you were born. So Calvary Chapel is something that I've committed to, the philosophy of ministry, the dynamics that they have. I've always appreciated it, so I believe you guys are in a good place. So from that, uh, last night, as we got uh, out of the van, we were talking about how we were going to divide the time, and I had told my friends, I said, hey, I got everything ready. You know, I can cut it down if I needed to. I have everything ready. Don't worry. I know what I'm going to teach. Got into my room, was praying a little bit, and so God gives me this idea. And I ended up rewriting everything I was going to teach. And um, uh, David will testify that I sent him my notes for printing at 1 o'clock in the morning. So I think this is, is kind of nice. Uh, it's, it's fresh from what I think God ins really inspired me to teach. And it's just things we need to do to make ministry more effective. And I'm going to go over 11 points, so it's pretty easy to take notes. But these are things that I've learned over the years. And you can tell I have a varied background in missions. I've been on staff at a, at a, at a church, you know, pastoring and, and all kinds of different things. So I have this kind of broad spectrum of ministry. And I could have, you know, taken some scripture and expounded on that, but you guys are getting that step by step all the way through the Bible. So these are just things I've learned in ministry that I would like to convey to young ministers like yourself. The first one is very obvious, and that's you need to be grounded in God's word. And you guys right here, regardless of what I say next or in the next few minutes, hold on to that simple truth. The key and foundation to all ministry is knowing God's word and also prayer. And we'll talk about prayer in a minute. I think those two things are the very uh, most obvious things. And for your generation, there's a heavy responsibility on your shoulders. The world is becoming more wicked. Things are not getting better. Even what we've seen in the last several months has been a dramatic turn uh, for the worst in, in my experience and my educated opinion. Things are not getting better. You know, So your generation has a great responsibility and a challenging ministry dynamic before you. Now, having, the word of your God, uh, having God's word in your hands is a distinct advantage over to what the early church had. Um, they did not have the full counsel of God. You guys have maybe multiple uh, Bibles. You have the full counsel of God written in your hands. The early church really didn't. So consider that for the first 1,500 years, there were basically no Bibles unless you were extremely wealthy or dignitary. Okay, You may have had parts of scripture. Um, then, even if you did have it, you couldn't read because the education level, especially before uh, the Reformation, which is where that 1,500 number comes in. So consider how people received the gospel was by word of mouth, but what did they know about doctrine really only came from memorizing creeds. 
okay? And we'll talk about a little more about creeds uh, in the next thing because creeds were a great thing because they learned about God, but there were things that missing that handicapped. So how people learned about the principles of God, the doctrine, the basic things they knew about Christianity really came from memorizing these creeds. Now, does anyone know what I'm talking about when I talk about creeds? Creeds were things that they memorized. And I'm going to give you an example of what a, a creed was like. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried, he descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and he ascended to heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Okay? So basically all the creeds read like this. There's, that's the Apostles' Creed. There's the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. Okay, and probably maybe if you go into church history, you're going to learn. And all those were written in the first 500 years. As Christianity developed, they did not have the word like you have today. They basically did everything um, surrounding these creeds. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is take advantage of your resources. Okay, so going back to these creeds, this is what they knew about Christianity. Okay. You today, on your phone, which you are not allowed, evidently, to have in your classroom, um, you can have multiple versions of the Bible. You can, have, you can download the app, the Blue Letter Bible, um, or, or anything you want. You can have the classics. We, say, we call them the classics, you know, Nave's uh, um, Bible Handbook, or Haley's Bible Handbook, Nave's Commentaries. You can have uh, Strong's Concordance. You can have all these tremendous resources that are enormous books on your shelf. You have them all in your phone. So what I'm telling you is to take advantage of the resources you have. The early church, like I said, they couldn't read. You guys can read. And in your hand, the amount of uh, information that you can have at your fingertips is incredible. Think how effective you should be if you take advantage of those resources. I, as a missionary in another country, um, and we would get teams of youth that would come very often. They would stay for two months. They'd do like an internship, missionary internship. And one of the things they could do is on their phone, they could have the Jesus film, the Mary Magdalene film. They could have discipleship things. So even though they didn't speak the language, and someone couldn't read, they could show someone a video, OK? The other thing is uh, we can distribute the audio uh, Bible. So what we were able to do, when I started as a missionary, when you distributed Bibles in rural areas, you got on your backpack, you put as many Bibles as you could put, and you would go door to door. I went in these villages in Haiti and the Dominican Republic in the, the early years of, of my missions work. Now. You can have 100 Bibles in your hand in micro SD cards, because 87% uh, of the world has a cell phone. On that card, we could give them the, the audio Bible, even if they couldn't read. Or actually, you could Bluetooth the Bible to them. Now, what this does for the sake of resources and the sake of having the Bible is it's unlimited. Once you have the file on your phone, um, there's some disadvantages to an iPhone because you can't put you know, a chip in it. But most, if I could say, poor people do not have iPhones. Okay? If you have an iPhone, consider yourself rich. But you can Bluetooth those files. Okay? So instead of having one, one Bible that I can only give to one person, that can give to one person, I could sit here. There's a thing called a live stream from a ministry called... Uh, I forget right now, but it's, a, it's an internet hub. And I could be right here, and I could distribute the Bible to all of you. They use this thing, uh, Renew, Renew Outreach, it's called. So they have people um, putting this 
wireless internet hub inside of their suitcases going into a bus stop in a Muslim country and broadcasting the gospel, just sitting there. And people go, oh, it says free movie. You know, people are getting on a bus. They need some entertainment. It says, actually says free movie or free content or free Wi-Fi. But it's limited content. It's not actually Wi-Fi. It's everything that's loaded on the hub. So they can download a movie, the Jesus film or whatever. And that's a, that's a tremendous resource. And you guys, being probably more tech savvy than me, I've been in Brazil for 13 years, there are all kinds of resources. So take advantage of the resources you have, because as you minister, especially if you minister overseas, they're great advantages. Um, along with, let's see, I'm trying to gauge my time because I have a few too many notes. Don't get lazy, number three, don't get lazy when things are good and be diligent when things are tough. Now understand, if the gross the, the growth rate of the gospel for the first 300 years continued, actually, mathematically, the task would be done. Everyone would be saved. And so you ask yourself, what happened? Why? Uh, do you mind repeating that? Uh, the third yes. Don't get lazy when things are good and be diligent when things are tough. Yeah, kind of a long title. So I was just saying, if the growth rate of the gospel of the first hundred years continued, the task would be done. And we ask, what happened? Well, I'm saying that Christians got complacent. You go, why? How could it happen? How could it happen? And it happened in a very interesting way, if you know your church history. Starting in the third century, in 313, we have the emperor Constantine. And you can debate whether he was really saved or you know, didn't believe the whole gospel or whatever. But one thing he did that wasn't true before is he made Christianity an accepted religion. Before that, it was predominantly persecuted, persecuted especially by the Romans. So Constantine comes to a realization of who God is, maybe understanding the complete gospel. So he makes it an accepted religion. But in 381... They had an emperor that actually made it the state religion. Can you imagine uh, the state of California saying, everyone must be a Christian? And in some ways, what that did in the minds of Christians going, oh, everyone's saved. You know, it's been mandated. It's been mandated that you're a Christian. And they got complacent. They said, we've won. We have control of our, our government. Our government is Christian. Everything is is wonderful. The, the gospel is accepted. There's no fear of persecution anymore. I mean, there was still some going on, uh, you know, in the Roman Empire. But here was a place that um, Christianity could be free. But we know it's not true. The, the conversions weren't sincere. I, as a missions pastor, was approached by this um, very intelligent guy, a lawyer, in fact, and he was trying to get the church to support a ministry in the Philippines. I said, okay, tell me about it. We have coffee for about two hours, he's telling me. And he was saying, last year we did these seven outreaches and 100% of every child that attended the outreaches got saved, every single one of them. Now, I have enough ministry experience to know and have been a missionary enough to know. I mean, that doesn't happen. I mean, it could. God pours out his spirit. We see in the Bible, in the book of Acts, you know, 3,000 people came to the Lord in a single day. But it doesn't say that everybody there came to the Lord. Statistically, I don't want to put God in a box, but statistically, that's not right. 100%. And I tried to explain to this guy who'd never been out of the country that culturally, like kids, especially like when foreigners are there, to please, to say yes, to be polite, or from from group influence, you raise their hand. The other thing is I watched the video, I think they were making a mistake because what they were telling the kids, who wants to go to heaven? Free tickets to heaven, giving away free tickets to heaven is distinctly different from asking someone to be a disciple, a disciplined disciple of Jesus Christ because that leads to 
a road of suffering. You know, if you've ever read the, the sufferings of Paul in, in, in Corinthians, there's a half a chapter. What did his obedience get him? Not more blessings, as some churches say, or perfect health or wealth. It got him suffering after suffering after suffering. So I don't mean to scare you, but the more obedient you are, the more stuff is, is going to happen, the more challenges. Now, we also stop being diligent. The flip side of, of point number three is when things get difficult and things look hard, it's human nature that we want to take the path of least resistance. It's our human nature. We don't like to do things hard. I mean, would you rather sweep the floor in here where it's air conditioned or sweep the floor outside where it's hot? There is a contrast. You know, you can often know if the Lord's calling you to do something if he calls you to do something difficult. I have a little phrase I say, the time of convenient evangelism is over. I'm sorry, your generation's left with some of the hardest parts. You know? So when things get difficult, those are the things you should chase, chase after, especially if God inspires you to do it. I think about our own church, as uh, Pastor Jason was talking, that you know, we have been fined $3.8, $3.9 million, and that is an obstacle. We chose to stay open as a church, and it's difficult. It's difficult. We are being criticized in the media. They're calling us super spreaders. Um, although, as far as I know, you know, it, it, we're not. We're not. Actually, for an extended time, I, I personally, I can only speak personally, I didn't know anyone in the church who, who had got COVID. You know? So, I mean, that, that's changed, but just a few people. We're not the super spreaders the media has sent. But also, when you do those hard things, if that's where God is blessing, incredible things happen. What Jason, I, I, I had to step out. I was the one that sneezed so loud out there. Um, what Jason may or may not have said is the church was like 350, and it went to 1,800, 2,000 people in a year because we stayed open. It was a blessing. And, and there's more to what God, how God prepared the church for that. We did major renovations and everything right before all this hit. So in the, doing the hard work, there, there is blessings. And in your generation, there are some hard things, even as Perry was talking about the, the Muslims. There is maybe what you call the Muslim invasion. Uh, Islam, uh, depending how you look at it, is pretty clearly the fastest growing religion. There are some smaller religions like the the high faith and stuff that are uh, percentage-wise growing faster, but the numbers are almost insignificant because it's, there are such small uh, faith groups. So don't get lazy when things are good. Don't get complacent. Don't go, okay, you know, never think, oh, this place doesn't need the gospel. One of the most evangelized places is Jamaica, okay? And a lot of American churches will go to Jamaica. Why? There's no language barrier, uh, although they speak um, kind of a different rhythm of English, but English is done. So I, ha I know someone who's a, a missionary, has a mission base in Jamaica, and they said, yeah, thousands and thousands and thousands of people come, but we still need the gospel. They haven't changed, the culture hasn't changed yet. There's not enough Christians actually to, to change the culture, you know, and Babies out of wedlock are at an all-time high in the country and all kinds of things. So in not be being complacent or not getting lazy, that's an area, okay, you can read that it's one of the most evangelized places, but it still needs the gospel. And if God calls you to do something difficult, it's probably God, you know. Um, Gerald was saying something yesterday in a casual conversation is, you know, yeah, uh, you get to a place and, oh, yeah, I feel like I'm called here. Why? Because it's nice. You're there at the nice time of year, and then winter comes in or the extreme summer comes in, and then it's not so nice. Uh, my wife and I lived 88 miles below the equator for 13 years. And um, typically, 
uh, we didn't have air conditioning. And that builds character. And that builds character. We actually had to air condition our classroom. We were, ran a college extension of a Christian university in Kona, Hawaii, University of the Nations. We actually, in the classroom, like you're sitting now, had to get air conditioning. You know why? Because as the students wrote, the sweat from their palm would get on the paper and their pens would stop writing. So we uh, ended up getting the students air conditioning. They call the classroom the sanctuary. So, but uh, God blessed us actually right now with a new ministry base and things are looking a lot better. If we can get sufficient electricity there, we're gonna have a little more air conditioning. Okay, number four. Don't forget the difference, and this is important, between discipleship and evangelism. And this is important. We use those words interchangeably, but they are in fact different. Okay? They are in fact different. What happens is uh, we evangelize, 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 but when we take a look at the Great Commission, it doesn't say to evangelize. Now, there are parts of the Bible that says do the work of an evangelist. I'm clear on that. But the main command of Christ is to make disciples. And it's really uh, an interesting thing because um, the ministry I worked for went through a shift. And what they said is we are delivering. All these babies are being born, but we're abandoning the babies. Is, is the word picture that was said to us. We're evangelizing, we're evangelizing. I can tell you, I can show you our ministry video from uh, 2009, 2010, and we actually had how many people were evangelized, how many people accepted the Lord. But then I was thinking a couple of years later, how many of those people are still coming to church? Yeah, they, they said a prayer, sincere prayer, we gave them a Bible, whether it was a micro SD card or whether we gave them a printed Bible. We wrote their names in it. We give them 10 scriptures that they should read or look at or listen to, you know. But we really didn't disciple them. And we did a, just a total paradigm shift in our ministry where we weren't going to look at the numbers anymore, but we were going to engage people personally and disciple them. And we created a whole uh, discipleship program. And in the context of that program, we did something uh, that we learned to do by mistakes. Um, that's another good one, learn from your mistakes. <laughs> that should be a whole other section. But so we were distributing the Bible on these micro SD cards, and we go, this is the answer. So I give, okay, you accept the Lord, and I give you the micro SD card. Do you know how many chapters are in the Bible? Just a bit of trivia. 66 books, chapters. Okay, there's 1,189 or 1,198. I'm a little dyslexic at the, the end there. Okay, but basically 1,200 chapters. So somebody comes new to the Lord, and you give them, here, here's the Bible. They put it on their, their phone, and they go, they're not well-educated. They're just listening to it. And you go, you know, 40 hours of listening, a week's worth of listening. And I don't know any of these books. I don't know what's good. I don't know what's important. I don't know. It's too much for a person that's never been in the Bible. I mean, they don't know it starts with Genesis, ends with Revelation or Apocalypse. And in the, uh, the culture that I was in, they call it Apocalypse. So we go, OK, we'll shorten it. We'll give them the New Testament. So we give them the New Testament. The problem with that is it's still a lot. So it's going to sound strange, but you know, our Bible distribution is just four books. It's Mark, Acts, Romans, and 1 John. Okay, 64 chapters. That is manageable for them. And if you could master all those books, matter of fact, if you can live by all the principles in Romans 12, come see me. I'd like to know how you did it. I mean, there is enough meat in there. And we think about the first century saints, as we were talking about with the importance of God's word, they only had these creeds and a few basic things that they were told, but yet I fully believe they were considered saved. 
I think you and your generation, you guys are completely saved, but as you know more about God's word, you know of greater responsibility. In Romans 12, 3, you know, it says, what is your reasonable response? That's your acts of service. It says to live your life as a living sacrifice. Do you know the problem with a living sacrifice? It keeps wanting to crawl off the altar. You know, so a living sacrifice is a, is a difficult thing. So the difference between discipleship and evangelism, just having someone say the sinner's prayer, okay, I know doctrinally that can be enough. And how do we know that? The thief on the cross. Was he ever water baptized? No. Did he actually say the sinner's prayer? No. But the only person that Jesus actually said, boom, you are saved, you know, you'll be with me today in paradise, was a guy that didn't do any good works except believe, okay? But in those scriptures I was talking about, like Romans 12, to live your life as a living sacrifice, you know, and Paul, yeah, he'd rather be in heaven with the Lord, but knew that God had called him to do things. So you're not on a cross moments from death. You have, many of you have 30, 40 years of ministry ahead of you. Let me just take a side note and just tell you, you are doing one of the greatest things you can do, one for your spiritual health, but also for your ministry. Just think, you are taking a year out of your life to be well-grounded in God's word, the foundation for doctrine, for the foundation for the way we do ministry, how we affect people's lives. It's all there before you in your Bible. By investing this year for the next, like I said, 30, 40, 50 years of ministry you have before you, you are going to be much more effective. If by what you get here this year, you're 10% more effective for 40 years, you have a lot more to offer. So you guys are getting well-grounded at a young age. You, you know, you're definitely doing the right things. So... Um, there is this, this difference. So invest in people. When I was uh, a new believer, I got saved. I owned a janitorial service, and I used to clean a restaurant, okay? So every morning, the restaurant didn't open until 11, so i go in there at like 10 o'clock, and I'd clean the restaurant. Only Thursdays, I couldn't run the vacuum because they were having a Bible study. Through a series of events that you know, I don't need to go into, I got saved. The owner of the restaurant led me to the Lord. After that, for 30 to 45 minutes a day, six days a week, before I cleaned that restaurant, he would sit with me and just go over principles of the Bible. One after another after another. For nine months. And finally, at the end of nine months, he goes, you don't need me anymore. You don't but you're going to make one commitment to me, Joe. And he was serious. He said, what I've just done for you, you do for somebody else. Now, what has Pastor Chuck said? Healthy sheep beget healthy sheep. And I think what he's talking about is discipleship. I know he's talking about discipleship. If you're healthy and able to convey something to others. There's a guy at our church. His name is Tim. And uh, for a while, I was helping with the maintenance of the church. Um, basically, they found out I could weld, so I ended up welding. And um, when I would pass, we have an area called the Olive Grove, a little area with uh, cement tables and stuff. And I'd go by, and I'd see this guy with somebody else. And I'd come back, and he'd be with someone else. So I finally talked to him a little bit because I really didn't know him. And he's discipling six men. He's taking uh, six hours a week, and he's meeting with these six men for an hour, one time a week. And let me tell you, I, uh, one time he was late, and there was a guy there, and I was talking to him, one of the guys that's being discipled. And he began to convey the value of that personal discipleship. Now, once you, maybe even now, but once you complete this course, you guys won't know it all, but you'll know a lot more than most people. And that puts you in the position of being a disciple. Now, someone may, you know, a, an older saint, we might say, may take time to invest in you. But at the same time, you can be investing 
in someone. You know, we got Paul, Silas, Timothy. We have this progression modeled and commanded in the Bible. Okay, don't take what I'm saying lightly. Discipleship, discipleship is the key. It is, is God's plan to save the world. You need the evangelism to get the people to disciple. But don't deliver those babies and abandon them. You understand clearly what I said. So it's very important. Uh, it's break time, right? You take five minutes? OK. That's your usual rhythm? OK. All right, so I'm just going to give you a little side note. And it's just to say this. As the world becomes more complex, we seem to make ministry more complex. And I'm guilty of this. When I went to, my wife and I went to the Amazon, because my wife is Brazilian, we are allowed to ship a 40-foot container without customs, without uh, import duty. Now, you have to understand that we owned a ministry called Missionary Resource Network. We started, I don't want to say owned, that's a bad word. We started this ministry called Missionary Resource Network. And our specialty was shipping 40-foot containers all over the world. Okay, we were a missionary logistics ministry. So when we shipped a container of our own, we could cherry pick all the stuff, okay? We sent to Brazil all the tables and chairs and stuff like you have, enough for, I think, to get started, 48 people. Uh, in Brazil now, we have a mission base that'll sleep 115. So the rhythm of what you're doing here is very similar to what we did in a different environment. My point is this. Um, there were all kinds of things I wanted to bring. And when we got there, we found out that some things were not acceptable. And I said to this guy at the customs, through my wife, who's speaking fluent Portuguese, I said, your law says these are the things, uh, you can bring things to do business and stuff, and our business is ministry. Therefore, we need these things. Now, this guy is not saved, but he said something incredibly profound to me, convicting. He said... If you are a preacher, all you need is your Bible and your mouth. And I'm just like, wow, I, I made ministry complex. You know, I mean, we were importing uh, generators, boats, outboard motors, because that's what we needed with integrity. That's what we needed to function our ministry. But uh, motorized things, transportation things were some on some limited list. But he said these words, all you need is your Bible and your mouth. And that's just a great thing to remember. So that's the quick little side note, and we are going to move to number five. Now, this may seem that it's more in the missionary context, and that's where I've gleaned this principle from. And at number five is we need to be a student of culture. Okay, we need to be a student of culture, and we need to be focused. So along with what I'm, I was saying about, you know, ministry can be very basic because we just need the Bible in our mouth, but we are ministering to an individual. And we will find that you can't talk to all people just the same. The first thing we need to consider is a person's cultural distinctives. We tend to take note of this when we go on a mission trip, but there's more to it. We must realize that each person has a personal culture. We are finding that out even from different parts of the United States. And along with that personal culture, we have a group culture or a, a small group cultural family culture. I can tell you that um, I actually have an Italian passport, but my dad was born in Mexico. Okay, all a long story, but true. Now, when we would have family events and we would sit down, have our turkey at Thanksgiving or, you know, whenever at a special event, my grandfather would not let us get up from the table. This is going to sound weird. Would not let us get up from the table until the women were done washing the dishes. Okay? I thought that was part of 
either Mexican culture or Italian culture. I learned it wasn't part of Mexican culture, so I thought it was a, an Italian thing. So I have a great friend, um, uh, a Calvary pastor who's Italian born, and I was talking to him, he goes, I never heard of that. So I went back to, to my uncle um, and I said, hey, what, how come grandpa did that? He goes, no, it was just out of respect for the women. I know it sounds strange. We'd never get up and help with the dishes, but out of respect, we would sit until they were done, which meant you could not go watch TV or anything until the dishes were done. And so there's, there's even that small group family culture, things that we do. There is a community culture. You here at CBI living gregariously in this base, you have developed a culture, a rhythm of how, how you come here and you, you all sit and you fellowship and, and everything. But that's going to be different than when you are outside of this community. Then you have a city culture, okay? You have a city culture. Yucca Valley is not the same as San Jose, California. You know, people may come, I really don't know, but people, this may be a place where people come to retire because it's reasonably priced. I can tell you the culture in San Jose is controlled by, by tech firms and people really go there to make money, to get rich. They don't go there to retire, it's just too expensive, you know. Um, uh, near where my mom lives, there's a two bedroom house that's $1.6 million. It's a two bedroom house, which will probably be torn it down and they'll, they'll make something big. It's a different culture and a, a different social economic dynamic. You have these regional cultures, different parts of the United States. I, uh, working for, for different ministries, uh, spent years living in Florida, and the rhythm of Florida is different than California. They do have some similarities because they have a lot of coastal things. They have surfers and skateboarders and stuff. And, and Southern California is different than Northern California. I mean, they print different t-shirts. You know, there's the SoCal and the NorCal. You know, there is a distinctive culture that's different. And of course, we have uh, national cultures. And we're aware of that when we go to a different country, uh, the way they, they do things. It's so funny. When I was first married to my wife, uh, I was in Bible college. And uh, I got married my last year of Bible college, kind of an inconvenient time, but I was in love. So I did it and uh, never regretted it. But I went there. I came home one day after classes, and in the garbage can was uh, the scallion onions. You know, they have like a little white bulb, and then they have like the green shoots. And all the white part was in, all of it was in the garbage can, and my wife had chopped up the stems. And I'm thinking, what, why did you throw the good part out? And my wife says, what are you talking about? Well, in Brazil, we would think of it more like chives. They eat the green part. We eat the tender white part you know, of the onion. And there's these cultural things. And I can tell you, you know, being in a cross-cultural marriage and my mother being in a cross-cultural marriage with my dad, these things that we think are so normal just aren't. Now, let's project that on the gospel. OK, you could go and you could pass out a 1,000 tracks downtown, OK? You may, you may have some success, OK? Someone may come back and say, hey, I want to know Jesus. It happens. It's documented. It does happen. But how most people come to the Lord is through a personal relationship. And you, as a minister, will probably minister to more people. But take a look at their personal culture, where they're coming from. Because when you understand their culture, you're going to be able to minister to them better. And that goes um, into all kinds of parts of a, personal, uh, of a person's life. Um, so each one of these cultural distinctives or categories, whether it's community, city, regional, group culture, you know, kind of builds on one another and makes us who we are as a person. Um, we also know that when we look at pictures of Jesus across the world, if you've traveled internationally, you go to Asia and Jesus kind of looks Asian and you, go, and you come to the United States and Jesus has, you know, flowing blonde hair and blue eyes and you go to South America, he has, you know, olive skin and dark eyes and dark hair. You know, it's a regional thing. It's a, 
but so we have to take culture, we want to minister to the person's culture, but we don't want to let culture change the gospel. Um, here, one of the things that Calvary Chapel cautions us on is kind of some of these emergent church movements. And the basics of that is when we're allowing culture to change the gospel, so that the gospel change culture. Okay. So, as I said, we also need to be focused. Um, evangelism needs to be more personal. Uh, but this is only relearning what Jesus did in his time. Uh, he had cross-cultural opportunities. We see Jesus ministering to the Romans. We see him ministering to the Sumerians, like the woman at the well. We see him to, uh, ministering to Greeks and to, to Jews. And you can see his different approach. And we can even see this in the Bible itself as we look at the different Gospels. You will certainly find, if you don't already know, that certain Gospels are written to the Jews. That's why they have the genealogies, because the genealogies are important to the Jews. Who is the Messiah? But then we have things like Mark that are just kind of action-packed storytelling, and that's to a different group of people, like the Gentiles. So we have this. Even the Bible is tailored to different cultures. But one of the ways that you know that the Bible is God's truth is the gospel goes into every culture. It enters into every culture. And you can spot bad doctrine when it doesn't go in. Think about the whole prosperity moment, uh, movement, okay? Go to Haiti, one of, considered one of the three poorest countries. I've been there 22 times, okay? So I know a little bit about Haiti. You are not gonna tell a person that you know, God wants them to be rich. And I mean this literally. On the street of Haiti, you can buy a cookie that's made from dirt, salt, and butter, okay? And the reason why they get have these cookies, you can actually buy, it's heartbreaking, you can buy a piece of this cookie. And it's what they give to kids to take away hunger pains so they can sleep. So how are you going to tell them about wealth and prosperity and that God wants you, you know, to have a big car? And, and It's not truth. But the basic gospel will go into every culture. And it's interesting. Uh, I was talking to, I think, uh, uh, David and Gerald and, uh, and Craig, who was teaching for you, about, about culture and things like that. And we were talking about the story of Peace Child. Did anyone, if you know Don Richardson's Peace Child, anyone ever heard that story? Well, it's rather interesting. So this missionary goes to Irwin Jaira, which is... What is Erie and Jai right now? Um, Papua New Guinea. Okay, so he goes to Papua New Guinea about 30 years ago, and he goes to this remote tribe, and he learns the language enough to preach the gospel. So he tells this tribe, um, now this tribe was warring with another tribe, and his wife was a nurse, and they were killing each other off. So he says they need the gospel, so he preaches the gospel to this tribe. Much to his horror... The hero of the story is Judas. In their culture, the hero of the story is Judas. And he was heartbroken. He says, how do I explain the gospel to these people? And if you ever get a hold of the book or see the movie or read about Don Richardson and Peace Child, and he was very well linked in with Calvary Chapel, spoke, spoke at a lot of our conferences, especially on the East Coast. Well, the two tribes were, were actually killing each other off to the point that their existence was challenged. And the two uh, chiefs of the tribes, to make peace, they exchanged child, children, peace child. So now they're one family. And so Don Richardson was able to make that a biblical parody. So he found out, he understood the culture and explained the gospel in a different way. Not the traditional way, but he said, just as you exchange the peace child, God exchanged a peace child with you. He sent his son to make peace with you. And once he had that biblical parody in place, he had revival. And you can read about it. I mean, there's whole books about it. If you read a book, The History of Missions, that said from Jerusalem to Eru and Jaira, the last chapter is about this guy who recently died. So you need to do it. Now, the other thing you have to know is we love Calvary Chapel. We love the rhythm of Calvary Chapel. But we have to understand, we also have a church culture. Uh, like I said, I've been around Calvary Chapel for a while, and I know when Calvary Chapel started to spread into Russia, they had problems. 
Why? Everyone, you know, Calvary Chapel's cool. But the thing is, we think a guy in a t-shirt, now I'm preaching in a t-shirt, okay, and a, and a pair of Levi's and a guitar lead, leading worship is cool and relaxed and accepting of everyone. But in cultures where church, they, you know, high church, liturgical church, they're used to more ceremony, that doesn't translate instantly. They think, where do you find this homeless guy to play the guitar? Couldn't you do better? So remember that as, as you minister. Culture is uh, important to understand and to adapt. Don't water down the gospel, but adapt to what's happening. Um, so we do need to, to differentiate what is cultural and what is biblical. Um, in America, we have this incredible mix of subcultures. And I'm adding this part because what COVID is doing, it is limiting missions in a way. It's limiting uh, mission trips. Now, I, I, you know, I tell you, I'm a missions pastor. I've done as many as, as 11 trips in a year. You know, every month we were going to another country out of Florida because you know, the, the Caribbean islands are easy to get to and we're running all these mission trips. But that ain't happening anymore. It's hard, and especially depending on your view it's on getting the vaccine. There's places that you can't go. You can't go to Israel now. Our, our church was planning a trip to, to Israel, you know, the Holy Land for educational purposes. It's basically closed. So we have this incredible mix of cultures. Um, I told you my father came to the United States when he was 13. Uh, my mother was born here, but full-blooded Italian. And um, we used to describe the United States as a melting pot. People came here and adapted to the existing culture. But what's happening now is people are keeping their subcultures. Where I was living in, in Florida and certainly here in California, there's Spanish-speaking neighborhoods. I went into a place, now I do speak some Spanish and certainly speak Portuguese, but I went into a McDonald's and uh, uh, I was having some bread or something and I was asking for butter and the girl behind the counter needed someone to translate what I was asking for for butter. Now I know the word's manteca, but I was surprised. So what I'm saying is there are subcultures existing in uh, America today. And that's going to be our new opportunity. Uh, profoundly, there is an old-time Calvary Chapel pastor named Neil Perillo, and he's written six or seven books. He lives in San Diego. Uh, I don't know. He may even come here and, and speak. But he wrote a book called Internationals Among Us, which talks about doing cross-cultural ministry in the United States because there's so many subcultures. You know, uh, Perry was talking about an Iranian church. And especially in California, you have a lot of subcultures. Where we are in Silicon Valley, we have Chinese churches, Vietnamese churches, Iranian churches, and of all different you know, ethnic groups. Where I um, lived for many years in Florida, they have lots of Brazilian churches and, and Cuban churches. Although it's Spanish speaking, but the Cubans seem to, you know, because they're exiles, they have a thing. So into the subcultures, and the book is called Internationals That Live Among Us. Okay, number six. Number six is going to be quite short. We need to be open to change. Things that worked in the past don't always work in the future. Now, I can tell you that I have a degree in youth ministry. I graduated in like uh, 94 or something, and I was asked uh, by our, excuse me, our youth pastor to help. And I said, you know what? I'm out of touch with the culture. I, um, you know, I didn't change. I said, I have arrested development. What I know about youth culture is 25 years old. I don't know what you know because you've, you know, you're with the youth. Um, remember Moses, okay, was told to strike the rock for the Israelites and water would come out and water would come out and water would come out. And then God said, speak to the rock. And he didn't speak to the rock. And that's one of the reasons he didn't enter the promised land. God punished him. He didn't change when God told him to change. And there are things that we do out of tradition. Now, we always blame the Catholics of doing things out of, out of tradition. But there are things within our own movement of Calvary Chapel. We do things. There's less of them, but there are some things that we've been patterned, we've been cultured to do that we uh, automatically do. And we need to be more specialized in our, 
in our ministry. Um, you know, we need to adapt to different people groups. Uh, so we just, we need to change. And we also need to change sometimes how we think about ministry. You know, we are cultured. I'm talking about culture. We're cultured American. I can tell you that I was sitting with a pastor and I was saying, um, basically telling this story that we go to these very small places. And he says, well, how much does it cost? And I said, well, it costs several hundred dollars to go to these small remote places. And he says, isn't there better places to, to minister? And I said, better places? What are you talking about? He says, well, isn't there bigger communities? And I ended up telling him, I said, by design, our ministry goes to smaller places. Let me explain. I said, if we're going to spend $100 on fuel, and we have the option to go to a place with 500 people or 50 people, return on investment, or our American minds think return on investment. What's better stewardship? We'll, we'll spiritualize it and say, use the word stewardship. If we're going to spend $100 in fuel, we should go to the place where there's 500 people. The problem is if we always think that way, the place with 50 people never gets reached. And I can tell you by design for 13 years, we always opted to go to a more difficult place, a further away place, a more expensive place. And I can testify beyond a doubt for 13 years, our ministry never had a financial crisis. We'd get these, we call them miracles in the mailbox. We're running low. I go to the mailbox, there's a $10,000 check. It happens. It's because I believe God wanted these remote places to be reached. Uh, number seven, you need to, you need a plan and you need goals. And we forget this sometime. There, there's a balance. We are waiting and praying for God to give us a vision, a focus. But when we get that call, let's make a plan. I can tell you that for many years, I taught uh, missions at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. You guys may not know, but that's the biggest Calvary Chapel. It has like 20,000 people. It's, you know, you don't watch the pastor, you watch the teleprompter. Um, it's not really my rhythm, but, you know, I was teaching missions there. And they have three levels of missions. And the last phase is invitation only. You have missions one, two, and three. So three, I would take all the missions, three students. These were people planning to go to the mission field in the next six to 18 months. And my job was to disciple them, mentor them, prepare them. And one of the things they had to do is write a ministry plan. And someone said, oh, I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit guide me. Yes, but there's a balance to that. Organize God's given you this goal, reach these people in this area, but you need to make a plan. You need to, you know, before you build a tower, Bible says, count the cost, make a plan. So when God gives you a vision, start to build a plan to accomplish that. The logistics, what are you going to, going to need to accomplish that? Are you going to need people around you? Um, are you going to have to learn another language? How are your finances going to flow? You know, right now I'm in the midst of finalizing a plan to develop a CBI in San Jose. So one thing I need, I need a promotional video. So I'm at JJ's doorstep going, hey, brother, can you help us? You know, those are the things you have to plan for. Okay? I mean, it, not to make it not spiritual, but the Holy Spirit shouldn't need to tell you those things. He's given you this vision but also pray that he, in fact, does tell you all the little steps you need and organize it. It's important to have a plan. I can tell you that uh, as I taught this Missions 3, there was a guy who gave us a 47-page ministry plan. And I'm thinking, I didn't want to read it. I thought it was too long. Extremely detailed. I can tell you he's in Africa today. He runs uh, two of the largest uh, Calvary Chapel uh, Bible Colleges in the world. He runs them in the slums of Kenya. Um, his finances are stable. He's able to um, uh, expand. Because he planned, his foundation was good, and he came back to me. Now, we don't cross paths very often. It's like the alignment of the stars when I see him face to face. And he says, you know, when you told me we had to write that plan, I go, you know, we don't, we don't need it. But he says, as I got into it, I realized I had to do it. And he says, thank you. Because, yes, the plan changed, but
But having that basic plan is what made us successful today. And he's been there about 19 years now, doing, doing quite well. So, um, and we need to have goals, um, things that we want to accomplish. Now, there's a mix of that because sometimes you just can't accomplish what you set out to do. But it's better to have a goal and move towards it than, not, than trying to not having a target that you want to meet. Um, over a year ago, I had some, a meeting with a large foundation that's giving away $2 million a month. You know, and we wanted to get a, a new boat. And the first thing they're going to ask for is they're going to ask for a plan. So as you start your ministry, your church, have a plan. And you're learning. You're learning the things you need to do. One of the things you'll probably do after this is you'll go intern at a church. Observe everything. Observe all the details that need to happen. You know, if, if uh, you just came into this classroom and uh, nobody turned on the lights and the, the AV wasn't started and the tables weren't set up, you know, someone didn't plan. Planning makes ministry go better. Number eight, number eight is uh, we need to measure the progress. This is something we don't do, but it's important. We need to see if what we're doing is effective, okay? And reanalyze and debrief and how can we tweak it, how we can make it better, okay? Again, this goes along with you know, be willing to change. If God tells you to go a different direction or do it a different way, don't always do it. Start with what you've heard works or what you've seen works and then tailor it for the specific culture or the specific people group that you are ministering to. So just to have something to measure the progress or reanalyze what you're doing. Was that event successful? Were people nurtured? Did people become better Christians? Or was it just a fellowship? Okay? And I know that those things are here. Number nine, uh, we need to commit to the time it takes. It needs a commitment. Like I said, these are things I've learned in, in ministry. If I didn't really commit to it, it didn't really happen. When you're convinced that God has given you a vision to do something, Commit to it. Commit to the time that it's going to take because it's going to get difficult. Okay, you think about um, the Apostle Paul. I was talking about all the obstacles that happened. He was being obedient. And when bad things happen, you go, you always ask the question, and it's a great question. Is God trying to stop me from going this direction? You know, you're trying to interpret the circumstances. Is God trying to tell me to stop, or is it Satan trying to have me stop? But you, you got to think in, in a way that God and Satan, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. Just let me explain before you judge me. God and Satan are asking the same question about your life. They are asking, what is going to move you from the plan of God? Okay? Satan is trying to put obstacles so you'll turn away from, from God's plan. But God is seeing how much he can trust you. You've been trusted with little, will be trusted with more. And I think if you're trusted with a spiritual responsibility and there's challenges and you overcome it, then God knows, okay, you've made that test. There's the next thing, the next thing, and the next thing. And we see that in the life of Paul. As I was talking about the sufferings of Paul, think of what he overcame. He was uh, stoned, uh, whipped multiple times, you know, 40 lashes minus one multiple times. Both of them should have been basically a death sentence. You know, he was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a viper on the island of Malta. I mean, bad things happened. So he was probably asking, Lord, is this really what you want me to do? My point is be committed and be committed to the time it's going to take. When God gives you a vision, hold on to that. Even when times get tough, hold on to it. Okay? until God really tells you no. Overcome the obstacles. Um, you know, the scripture, uh, Galatians uh, 6, 9 says, let us not become weary of doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now, I want to say points 8 and 9 is we need to measure the progress and we need to be committed and committed to the time it will take. 
So points eight and nine, we need to be careful, especially when we're pioneering a ministry to a difficult people group. Uh, if you are ministering, if you chose, and I pray that you do, you pray to go do a difficult ministry, you go overseas, you're trying to reach an unreached people group. And there are unreached people groups in the United States. I mean, you could say surfers are an unreached people group. You know, we need someone ministering to the surfers and the skateboarders. We, uh, at our church, we're kind of unofficially starting a, a thing ministering to political activists because our church hosts some events where unsaved, like political activists come. And we're starting to systematically pray for those people. And in our prayer groups, we're praying for them. And that's a specialized uh, focus group. But if you go to an unreached people group and you're trying to measure your progress, you may not have a lot of spiritual success. I um, broke down in the parking lot when I was driving across Texas, and there was a bus that said the Jerichos. And it was this trio that sang. And um, I figured they were, were Christians from some symbols on the bus and stuff, and I started to talk to them. And they were telling me they were they're singers from, from Zimbabwe and South Africa. And uh, they were telling their story, and they were t saying that their father was a missionary there. And uh, as we were having this wonderful conversation, they said their father was criticized because he died a martyr. They killed him with machetes. But when he died, there were only three converts, and he was there for many, many years. And um, they said people kind of judged him or disappointing. But do you know that one of those people, they said, now preaches to crowds of 65,000? So you could, you could say, oh, I'm not very successful. Okay. So what I'm saying is temper, when you measure your progress, just understand, if you are really pioneering a ministry, it can be... It can be tough, you know, and you may not always have the successes and the numbers that you may want to see. You know, that's part of the problem uh, uh, at some of the churches that I've spoke at or taught at. They want to see, you know, the fruit. If they're supporting a missionary, well, you know, after three years, they're not reporting that they've had any, you know, real successes. Uh, they're planting a church and, you know, it's not growing. And there's a little bit of that judgment, you know, if your church is big and successful. But we got to remember, these people who go overseas are doing some difficult things. They're asked to be pastors in a cross-cultural environment, which is uh, difficult. Um, number 10, don't forget the unreached. I can't stress this enough. Um, Perry, you know, came from a Muslim background, but certainly very Christian. Let, let me tell you that Perry teaches our Calvary distinctives at our church, and he's in charge of our new believers. Okay? Um, there's nothing left in his Muslim mind um, about any value in uh, is the Islamic faith. So don't forget the unreached. And in when you think about the unreached, look for the hidden and small unreached people groups. Brazil where I was, is actually the second largest missionary sending country in the world next to the United States. And you think, why would God call someone to a country with the second most missionaries? It doesn't make sense. But if you study Brazil, you'll find out that 19% of the world's unreached people groups are in Brazil. Not 19% of the population, but 19% of the unreached, almost 20% of the unreached people groups but the groups are small. And we really need people to go to these small, unreached groups. We're aware of what's happening in the Muslim world and how fast they're growing and a need to, to you know, face that with, with the gospel, well-explained gospel. But don't forget about these small, unreached people groups. Let me tell you real quick how God called me to Brazil. I was a ship's officer going up the Amazon, I'm looking at these charts, the official charts from the government, and I'm seeing people in, in canoes all down these little waterways. And I was thinking, God, how, how do people get called to a place with no name that's not on a map? And God spoke to me and said, I just showed you. That was convicting, very convicting to me. God said, I just showed you that there are people here living off the grid you know, with no map. I mean, the only way someone's going to get called if they take a dart 
and they throw it at a world map, and it ends at a place, and they can calculate the exact longitude and latitude of where that community is. Or he's got to show them, and God showed me, and that's how we got called to the unreached. That's how we ended up in Brazil, focused just on unreached peoples, unreached people groups. You can even Google them. They're called the Kilimbolas. And the Kilimbolas may sound tribal, but they're actually descendants of escaped slaves. So way back when, when there's slavery in Brazil to escape slavery, they would go, they would escape and hide in the jungle. And eventually so many slaves uh, escaped that there's communities in the jungle, hidden. Sometimes you walk uh, a half mile or more from the shore to get to the communities in the center of little obscure islands. Um, so remember, don't forget the unreached, okay? Yeah, there's easy ministries to do, but don't forget the unreached. The last thing, I don't think I have to go deep into it because I want to have a little time for, for questions, if you have questions, but prayer. All these steps, all these things, you got to pray about. What does God want you to do in this area? Developing your goals. Where is God calling you? Uh, Pastor Jason talked about how God called him. He has a unique ministry that I admire. He just waits for God to speak to him through prayer, and he goes to a place and helps, and goes to a place and helps. What a great ministry. Not typical, but what a great ministry he has. And I, I can't even explain to you all that. I, he's been there much longer than me, but I see the work he does and the development in the facilities that we have in his gift for administration at the church is going to be uh, missed when he goes. So number 11 is prayer. Everything needs prayer. That's how you gain wisdom. Um, yes, the task for your generation is big. Uh, it's going to take a lot of effort. Um, but I want to tell you something I saw in a video 30 years ago, and it's stuck. It's almost like a theme that I always tell people. And uh, this doctor who was working for Mercy Ships, volunteering for Mercy Ships, was interviewed. He made this statement. He said, if every one of us does something in the little part of the world God allows us to see, then something will really get done. Now, we feel insignificant. We're a drop in the bucket. But if all of us are putting drops in that bucket, the bucket does raise. I'll tell you real quick, one time uh, on the ship, our water maker broke. We could not turn salt water into fresh water. There's 65 of us. We consume 250 gallons a day of water. Okay, maybe like 150 or, or less if we did. That's without showers. Showers stopped. Okay, we're off the coast of Haiti. We ended up, it's a long story. It's actually in a book, um, this story. We ended up drinking the water that condensed off the air conditioners. You know that little drip? And you think that little drip, that little drip, that little drip added up from all the air conditioners, enough for us to drink, for us to, I don't want to be dramatic, but almost stay alive because we're like three days from any place to get water. And when we get to the place, we'd have to treat the water and make sure it's safe to drink. So this was a miracle. Like I said, it's written in a book. So you're little, you think you're insignificant. It adds up if we're all doing our part in obedience. And in the end, there's really only one problem, and that's lack of obedience. So I'm going to encourage you to dig into, you are getting a tremendous foundation. Dig into a difficult ministry. Don't take the easy path. You know, Like I said, the time for convenient evangelism is over. And when God calls you, once you've, yeah, this is what God wants me to do. And it may only be for a season. There are things I, that God commanded me to do I thought I'd do for the rest of my life. And God changed it. God changed it. Okay? But when God tells you, you stay there for as long as God has you until he moves you into another thing. So, like I said, last night at like 11 o'clock, God said, no, I want you to present something different. And I'm just trying to tell you what I've learned from ministry. These are just the, the top 11 things that came to mind that are important. When you have your own ministry or even when you are working under the wing of someone more experienced and you can learn, just remember these principles. And I pray that through those, you're going to be 
more effective. So we've got like uh, seven minutes. If any of you have a question for me, have a question for Jason, or have a question for Perry, we're, we're open at this moment. Anything? Anything I said you didn't understand? Yes? You said you were from Florida? I was born in San Jose, California. Uh, and 10 days after I graduated Bible college, uh, I moved to Florida to do fundraising for Mercy Ships. And uh, that stopped after about a year, and I went right on staff at a Calvary Chapel. So I lived there for many years. And we had this ministry, I told you, Missionary Resource Network. We actually had a thrift store. We had a thrift store for 10 years, and that's how we shipped donations to, to missionaries all over, mostly Calvary Chapel missionaries. And um, then, like I said, in 08, God called us to Brazil. We were there for 13 years, and then back. Yes? Yes? 